Hello. In this episode, I visit the stunning clifftop aerodrome Bolt Head in Devon and explore the area's beautiful coves and beaches. Welcome to the Flying Reporter Aerodrome Review, sponsored by AOPA UK. Hello and welcome to another Flying Reporter Aerodrome Review. Today we're heading to a beautiful aerodrome. I'm really looking forward to visiting Bolt Head and its neighbouring resort, Sulcombe. It's on England's southwestern coast in an area of outstanding natural beauty, midway between Plymouth and Torquay. And with the scenery around that coastline, landing there should be a real treat. The airfield sits just half a mile up from the rugged South Devon coastline. And the circuit and approaches are flown over the dramatic cliffs, the open farmland, and those picturesque coves and bays. I hope my onboard cameras will capture the view today. For added pleasure, my route is taking me westbound along the Jurassic coast from Bridport to Exmouth and Torquay. There's a danger area here, Delta 012, which is active weekdays and other times by NOTAM. It's inactive today, but if it were active, you could try and get a danger area crossing service from Plymouth Military or London Information. There's a telephone number in the AIP if you wanted to call and check what's going on. Other than that, there isn't too much airspace to worry about, just a Class A airway at flight level 085. Now one thing that I'm planning to do, because this is a farm strip and for the most part is unattended, there's no uh, specific radio frequency, um, I'm going to approach it in the way that I would approach any unattended farm strip really, and that is to have a good look at it before I make my approach. So I know they're very sensitive to noise around here, so I'm not intending to come down and do a low approach, which might be prudent in, in uh, some places. But I'm going to go. Up, I'm going to go over it um, at altitude, probably you know, four four thousand feet, to have a good look. I can check the windsock, check the surface, check there's nothing on the runway that should be. You know, you don't know. You might have animals on there. You might have farm equipment on there. So, I think that would be a prudent thing to do. But they do want you to stay, obviously, to the south of the strip um, and not uh, venture to the north over the noise sensitive areas. Um, they say you're not allowed to do circuits here, but I think. I wouldn't class this as a circuit. I would call this as normal aviation practice when approaching a farm strip. So fuel is on the tank with the fullest. Radios are tuned. We're going to switch to, we ought to switch to Salkham uh, in a second. Radios, engine temperatures and pressures are in the green. We'll go mixture rich now. Direction indicator is 190. Uh, and altimeter, we're on the Four, Exeter QNH 1027. Elevation here five, is 420. Golf India Victor is one mile south of Dartmouth. Uh, beginning my approach now for bolt head, uh, changing frequency to safety call 135.480. Golf India Victor, thank you. Squawk Consul Security, g'day. Squawk Consul Security, Golf India Victor. Sorkham traffic, Golf Bravo, Mike and New Victors, PA28 Arrow, two miles to the east making an overhead pass at altitude 3,000 feet to join downwind runway 11 at Sorkham, Sorkham traffic, which is Bolt Head traffic. Uh, Roger Wall this is Bolt Head and uh, I'm just currently mowing the runway and um, when I get you in sight I'll uh, pull off and let you land. Roger Bolt Head, uh, yep, we'll make an overhead pass at 3000 and then uh, position downwind, I'll make the circuit calls. Roger. So, as we've heard there, they're mowing the grass, so clearly making a call on the radio and making an overhead pass was the right thing to do. So we're going to get the gear down, that will just help us with the speed in the descent, because we've got quite a lot of altitude to lose once we're uh, overhead. Got three greens, brakes, undercarriage, mixture, fuel, landing light, carb heat, direction indicator, doors are locked, strapped in, and altimeters on uh, QNH. 400 feet is the elevation. 
So I can see the tractor at the start of the 1 1 threshold. We've got a left crosswind. Apart from the tractor. Bolt head traffic of Bravo Mike into Victor's right hand downwind, runway 1 1. Bolt head traffic. The circuits at Bolt Head are to the south of the airfield. There's no dead side due to that being a noise sensitive area. So you need to make a downwind or base leg join, really. Reds, blues, and three greens. The downwind leg is flown over the sea, just off the cliff face. It's quite dramatic when you turn base with the rising terrain coming towards you, and it gives you quite an unsettling perspective. Because of the topography, I found it hard to judge my descent profile at first. Bowhead traffic, Gulf and Victor's final, runway 11 to land, bowhead traffic. The wind favoured runway 11 today, and so on base leg, I did my best to avoid the hotel and holiday cottages, making a slightly misshapen turn onto final. Slightly left crosswind. It was a pretty windy day here when I came, so you can see it's a bit of a handful. It's very exposed and so any notable wind is going to have an impact, particularly from the south over those cliffs. The runway is straddled by crops either side, so don't mistake those for the runway. And there's a four foot fence either end. They're very protective of their airstrip here and want to keep the locals happy, so they restrict it for use by pilots who have more than 100 hours P1. They generally don't accept aircraft with engines having more than 200 horsepower, and because of the length of the runway, 600 metres, and its location, they recommend you have previous experience with farm strips. It's not difficult to land here really, but they've had a few unfortunate incidents with inexperienced pilots that they don't want to repeat if at all possible. Aircraft parking is clearly signposted. There's loads of room. Generally, the airfield is unattended though, and when I visited, there were no toilet facilities or shelter, aside from the main hangar if anyone's there and they've opened it. So you book in and pay your landing and parking fee in this little wooden hut. Oh, at least you could shelter in here if it was raining outside. There's a little, little hut here. I've got your uh, aircraft movements lock and a little uh, honesty box for landing fees. They provide some heavy-duty tie-down stakes and a sledgehammer, which is a thoughtful touch. The main gates to leave and re-enter the airfield are padlocked. The code is in the hut and on the email you receive when you PPR online. Right, I'm going to have a poke around uh, the aerodrome in a minute. Then I'm going to be heading off into Sorkham to explore. Now, Sorkham is sometimes described as Chelsea-on-Sea, and that's because the cost of some of the property there is off the scale. It's the most expensive, or some of the most expensive property in the UK. Before any of that, though, I just want to thank AOPA UK for sponsoring the Flying Reporter Aerodrome Review. AOPA is a membership organisation standing up for pilots like you and I and giving a voice to aviation businesses and aerodromes. I'm an AOPA member, and if you want to see GA prosper, like I do, then why don't you join as well? Because the more of us that are AOPA members, the better clout the organisation has. Right now, Flying Reporter followers can get 25% off new one- and two-year memberships to AOPA UK by using my special link that should have popped up on your screen. Alternatively, use the QR code or see the link on my website or in the video description. Bolt Head Airfield is looked after by a small group of volunteers. One of those is pilot and local builder Keith Wingate. So Keith, how do you run things here at uh, Bolt Head? Well, we're just uh, a, a rural grass strip that we run for, for ourselves, but we get quite a lot of joy out of letting people come in and flying in and visiting us. It's a great way of seeing the area. You know, we're surrounded by beautiful countryside and beaches and nice walks and a lot of people come down to enjoy that. It's an area of outstanding natural beauty. You've yes. got National Trust land all around you. Yes. How do you fit in with the neighbours and how do you protect yourselves from criticism from them? So when you come to visit Bolt Head, we make sure that everybody's got a sensible brief. We alter the brief continually and update it when 
we find out that people didn't understand or things weren't clear and to make sure that people can operate here sensitively and that they understand the area they're flying into. And we have a no-fly area just to the north of us so that aircraft don't go there to keep it nice and quiet for our neighbours. And we'll also moderate the number of visitors we're getting if, it, if that becomes a problem. Has it become a problem? Do they, no, do they question not you? A, not no, a, not at all. Because you could become extremely popular here, I would have thought. We, yeah, and it can get quite busy in the summer. And, and at that point, sometimes we, we, we look at the number of movements we're getting. And sometimes we'll, we'll, we haven't yet, but we'll stop the number of PPRs that are coming in. You've got some nice new chalk on the... Uh... On the, on the beginning, well, chalk, chalk and, and, and uh, concrete. At the concrete, bit. you knew concrete numbers, numbers, yeah. Because I think some people were mistaking the local crops for the runway. Yes. Because it, it, I mean, it does stand, I found it did stand out quite well, but obviously yes. we've had a bit of rain, so it all looks, yeah. all looks quite nice. Well, it depends on the time of year and what state the crops are at either side, yeah. you know, and the runway's nice and green, it's obvious, but when the crop is the same colour, it's not so obvious. So we put numbers in to make it, you know, because that's an identifiable thing if you're used to flying, you know, into bigger airfields. You know, you look for the runway numbers. In terms of facilities here, I mean, it is an un effectively unattended That's airfield. Right. Yeah. You might be here, you might not be here. Yeah. There's that little hut that people can go and sign in. Actually, you can take shelter from the rain in there, yeah. I noticed. <laughs> but in terms of everything else, there's not a lot else here. You, you do, at the moment don't have a toilet, but I think in the summer you bring one in as a portal. Yeah, I mean, this is effectively our closed season. Uh, but, well, when the clocks go forward, we put a, a, a portal here. But this year we're going to fit in a proper proper toilet plumbed in you know and we're going to put a porter cabin so there's like somewhere where you can get a cup of tea and, and sit and warm up especially if it's daylight today yeah um, but you know that'll probably be next year now and wi-fi I, I read somewhere you've got some wi-fi yeah here, so we've got right? wi-fi in here and we've got wi-fi in the uh, arrivals lounge so is that that's fairly easy to lock yes, onto, is it yeah yeah and in terms of getting on and off the airfield then so let's say i'm going into Sulcum, um we could walk or we could get a taxi i think yes so where would the taxi come and, or how would we walk there? Well, there's two ways of walking there, but you can walk out the end of the airfield here, or you can walk out the other way. And, and how, uh, how long is that walk? It's 25, 30 minute walk, um, but it's just, it comes out to the cliff path and goes down into Solcombe and then you can walk along through Solcombe. And taxis, getting taxis here, I mean, a lot of places are difficult to get taxis at the moment, but I think you, yeah, it's a busy place, isn't it? It's yeah. a busy tourist place too. It is, yeah. So what would you say about taxis? Well, taxis, um, most of the local taxi firms are familiar with us and know yeah. where we are, so they come up to the gate uh, near where you book in. Yeah. I'm trying to keep an eye out for disabled flyers as well, because yeah. I think, you know, they get a bit of a rough deal at some mm. of these aerodromes. Mm. You're all grass, which of course makes it a bit difficult. Yes. Um, you know, if, if a disabled person called up, and there's no, not many facilities here, you know, toilets and things, would you, would you try and bend over backwards for Absolutely. them and help them yeah, yeah. come in? I mean, we, we sort of accommodate everybody who, who, who comes. You know, because some, some people want, you know, park longer or, you know, camp or whatever. So they talk to us and we accommodate them. Yeah. And we would do, absolutely, of course. And how does the airfield cope up over winter? Do you close to visitors over the winter? Um, well, we have been, but we're, we're in, in this last year, we haven't closed over the winter. Um, what we will do is we update the website to say if the runway's not serviceable. Yeah. But... It's only been unserviceable once in the time I've been here because mm. uh, it's incredibly well drained. Even when it's even after a period of you know prolonged rain, it's been it stays serviceable. Mm. Um, but you know that would be on our website. And if you've got any doubts, you can just give us a call. I've got to ask you about your fees because compared to say a full service aerodrome, you're pretty comparable, and yet there's nothing here. Mm. Can you talk about your fees and why they are? Sort of, you know, I could probably land cheaper at a, an aerodrome with full ATC some places. Yeah, that's 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 fair comment, and and the level set there, really, um, because of the unique place we are, and and what it costs us to sort of maintain and run the airfield. Um, we don't get the volume of traffic, um, and we, you know, we we don't want unlimited movements here. So we set it at that level, and we reinvest nearly every penny that you know of the profit we make if we make a profit in maintaining the airfield, mowing it, providing the facilities, it's surprisingly expensive. I can tell you, you know, from previous experience, it's, it, it's difficult to make ends meet. Keith was very good to take me on a tour of Sulcombe and the surrounding sites. It's very pretty, but just look at the width of the road though. If I was driving, my stress levels would be through the roof.
apparently you get very good at uh, reversing here in <laughs> here in Devon. In Devon because the roads are single track everywhere. Do you need your own special Devon driving license? I don't think it's any different. I think it's the same as everybody else. <laughs> but yeah, you do get good at reverse. <laughs> All fun aside, I don't know how you'd get around here in the summer. It gets busy and pretty clogged up. Taxis can be hard to come by too. But the beaches and bays are just stunning. I stayed overnight at the South Sands Hotel, which has its own beautiful beach, South Sands, on its doorstep. And this was the view that I woke up to this morning. Fabulous. So I've booked a, uh, a sea view room. I'm in room 11 here. And it's a very, very impressive room. Um, instantly you walk in and there's a, a a bath staring at you, which you don't normally see, do you, when you uh, go into a hotel room. Um, a lovely king-size bed and uh, a lovely view of the beach out there as well, which is fantastic. Love it. You have the same view from the restaurant where you'll have breakfast or an evening meal. The menu caters for most tastes. I really enjoyed my short stay here. It was a comfortable and high quality hotel. I paid a bit more for the sea view room. My overnight bed and breakfast was £209 for a midweek stay in low season. I checked the price for the same room here for a one night midweek stay in June or July and it came to £420. Sulcum is not a cheap place to stay. back to Bolt Head Airfield, and you might have been wondering what that big concrete building is. Well, it turns out that Bolt Head was a radar station during the Second World War, tracking enemy aircraft crossing the channel. And then in the 1950s, this concrete bunker was built and the radar station upgraded to monitor threats from the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The building is now in private ownership and it's looked after by based pilot Chris Howell. 1949, approximately, when the Russians first let off their, their nuclear warhead, was when the uh, sort of NATO and the Western governments started panicking a bit yeah. and started developing these types of radar sites. So it was principally to track the incoming Russian bombers coming in. And it was designed to protect the people inside as well. I mean, how thick are these walls? The, the walls are three feet thick. <laughs> Uh, the, the, interestingly, the roof was only one, feet, one foot thick to start with. Um, they added another foot on later. But it was principally just to offer them some small protection to anything locally that might have been going on. Right. At some point, it became what, what's called a, a base for the, the regional... Seat of government. The, the government, wasn't it? Yes. It was a seat of government. What was that all so about? So the RAF regiment left here in 1958, yeah. so effectively the RAF the whole site closed down from the RAF point of view. And the government at the time were forming regional seats of government throughout the UK yeah. in the early 50s. And they had this system where they developed 12 regional control centres throughout the whole country. Yeah. And they took over this building, and this was Region 7, which would have looked after the whole of the South West in the event of a nuclear war. And the idea was that it would uh, house around about 250 civil servants. It's in private ownership now. Yes. And I think you, you kind of, being based at the airfield, keep an eye on it for the owner, don't you? And, and yes. check that nothing comes to harm, nothing, yes. no harm comes to it. And, and a part of that means you can go inside. We're not allowed to go inside today, but I mean, what's it like inside now? Well, the principal, principally there's 56 rooms on two floors, yeah. which amounts to, I think the total square is about 33,000 square feet. Wow. On two floors. Yeah. So it, effectively inside, it looks like a, a, a regular office block yeah. inside. It's, it's quite remarkable. And I was quite surprised when I first was able to see it inside, because when you initially think of a bunker, it's gonna be dank and damp and horrible, but it's not, it's, it, it could be used today. It's, the, the decor was pretty good. Yeah. It's fascinating hearing about this part of our history, and it certainly gives the airfield its character. Unfortunately, it's not possible to tour the bunker should you visit, but you can certainly take a look from the outside. 
Well, this certainly has been an aerodrome review packed with information. I hope you found it all useful and inspiring. I should mention that Bolthead doesn't have fuel and it's mandatory to obtain PPR if you're thinking of visiting. So I've enjoyed my short stay here in Sulcombe and if you're looking to unwind, take some long walks, take some fresh air, enjoy stunning scenery, then Bolthead is well worth a visit. And if you're an airfield owner or aerodrome manager and want to put your site on the GA map, then do get in touch. Check out my website, www.johnhunt.net. There you'll find a catalogue of some of the other airfields I've already visited. The Flying Reporter Aerodrome Review is sponsored by AOPA UK. Sign up for a discounted membership now. Until next time, fly safely, my friends. <laughs>